Osio dohitsu. Alagi, the Cherokee language. That's how we give greeting. Osio dohitsu. Now, we're used to traditional greetings in English as well. You'll hear people say, hi, how are you? And we hope, we hope without ever speaking it, sometimes without ever thinking it, that when we say, hi, how are you, they'll answer, fine, how are you? <laughs> and we don't know with any, any real sense of decorum how to respond to, not so hot, thank you. <laughs> well, in Cherokee, we also ask a language on greeting and uh, the, the question on greeting, and, and that question in, in greeting, dohitsu, is, are you full of joy? And as we meet someone, particularly a young person, we ask that question and listen for the answer. And if that day we happen to be greeted by someone who says no, then our task for them is to help them find their joy before we part, to help them re-experience that. And as I was thinking of greeting you today, I thought to myself, it's your job as well. It's, it's a task which you've inherited from 100 years ago when the Sisters of St. Scholastica founded two-year college and shortly the 100th anniversary of four years. It's a task that is about your investing in the present moment for a yield in the future. A yield in the future, to paraphrase Peggy Goldfarb, that you may not see. Our investment in education is an investment always in the generations before us. An investment that was made 100 years ago in absolute faith that you would be here today to continue that investment. That you would be a part of that stewardship that a community started a hundred years ago. Teaching, guiding, mentoring, providing a safe space and haven for students is a great gift and an investment in the future we may not see. It is an act of faith and a belief that the future will matter. Education is one of the most liberating forces in human development. It is a gift which is transmitted intergenerationally. Once given, education cannot be taken away. It is a great act of generosity. And so when I thought about meeting you today, there were many things I thought I, I might want to say and a few things that I was told I should say. And among them was a story that, that I thought I should start with. It's a story, as I was thinking of which story, uh, one that I had borrowed from before, one, uh, I, as, as I was here at that wonderful buffet, I thought, well, my story should include food. And so as I thought, what story would include, and I remembered one. It's a story which I've shared before. It was first shared with me by a young Methodist minister, as I recall. And it was a story about a very curious young Cherokee male. This is at least how I recalled it, even though it's not, I'm certain, how it was told. This very curious young man, he, he was curious about everything. He would open cupboards, he'd forget to close them. He'd open drawers, he'd take things apart, he couldn't put them back together. He was always asking why he was, above all else, incredibly curious. And then... But one day, our, our, our very curious young man, well, sadly, he, he up and died uh, of curiosity, of course. But having given greatly to his community, helping, supported his neighbors and his family, he was whisked up to, by the, to the pearly gates where he was greeted by none other than St. Peter himself. St. Peter came out and he said, well, welcome, young man. We're very glad to see you here. But, well, quite frankly, we were expecting you a little sooner. And our curious young man said, well, well, well you know, St. Peter, there, there, there were things along the way, and I was. And he says, I know, you were curious. Well, be that as it may, son, please let me be the first to welcome you into the first room of heaven. And with that, St. Peter reached back, and he laid his hand upon the latch to open the doorway to the first room of heaven. And as he lay his hand upon the latch, he, our curious young man said, well, well, well St. Peter, I'm, I'm, I'm... Yes, my son? Well, St. Peter, I was, um, uh... I'm curious, you know, I, 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 was, I, was, I was wondering, um, what is it, my son? Just ask. Well, well St. Peter, I, I was wondering, if before I go into the first room of heaven, could I, um, 
Could I see what I passed up along the way to get here? St. Peter said, you mean? And he goes, could I have a quick tour of hell? <clears throat> no, no one had ever asked St. Peter that question before. And the young man was, if nothing else, curious and had given greatly to his community. He was an avid member of the Alumni Association. He supported his school. <laughs> There were no rules against it. And so St. Peter took the young man by the hand and uh, leaped over two clouds and down a chute, and they stood there at the doorway to the first room of hell. St. Peter drew a long, deep breath, and he, he grabbed that rusted-out knob. There, there's an express entrance, but not if you live in Duluth. <laughs> and as he pushed open that creaky door, he led our curious young man into the first room of hell, and... Well, they looked around, and I'm so sorry I'd have to, well, it was a room that looked a lot like this one, I'm sorry to tell you. And, oh, there were about 300 people in the room, and the front of the room had this large stage, and, and on the stage, it was this, this long buffet table, it was covered with anise variety of beef, and chicken and pork, the other white meat. There was fish and nut meats and, and desserts and the aromas just filled the air and gathered around this beautiful, bountiful table in hell were 300 thin, gaunt and starving people. You see, because in hell, in hell with all of that bounty, well, in hell they strap a three-foot-long knife to your left forearm and a three-foot-long fork to your right forearm. And the best that you can do is cut small scraps and hope that they'll drop into your mouth. Well, it didn't take our young man long to say, St. Peter, I've seen enough. We can go down with that. St. Peter let out his blessed breath. He grabbed the young man by the hand, slamming the door behind him, and went up the chute over two clouds. And with some relief, St. Peter reached back, and he turned the latch to open the doorway to the first room of heaven. And as he ushered our curious young man into that first room of heaven, they they looked around the room, and I'm delighted to tell you, they saw a room that looked exactly like this one. It was a beautiful, beautiful room with a stage up front, and there was a long, long buffet line. It had endless array of beef and chicken and pork. There was an expanded vegetarian section for those who care. There's nut meats and desserts. The aromas filled the air and gathered around this beautiful, bountiful table where 300 somewhat portly individuals, I hesitate to tell you there are calories in heaven, but they don't count. Anyway, <laughs> gathered around that beautiful bond with 300 happy, joyful people, because in heaven, around that bountiful table in heaven, well, in heaven they strap a three-foot-long knife to your left forearm and a three-foot-long fork to your right forearm. But you see, in heaven, in heaven, they've learned to feed each other. And that, I was told, was one difference between heaven and hell. Community. It's a story I like to share because it is a story of shared responsibility. It's a story of mutual interdependence. It's a story of generosity once begun, returned again and again to build a community you can rely on. It's a remarkable story because of its intentionality, because of the way in which we relate to each other. And as I had a chance to meet with you and think about what should I say about building community, I will have nothing to match the intellectual rigors of those in the monastic order who have thought for generations about community. So maybe I can tell you something about my own sense of the community I hope that we will build, a community which is intentional, a community which serves each other, a community that helps take us from simply being people who rely on others towards being people who others can rely on. Because that's the gift we can bring to a community. 
We often invite people to the table and we talk about helping our students be self-reliant. And that's a very important thing. But in community, we have to always measure self-reliance against abandonment. All too often, we, we engage in a kind of activity where we, we ask someone in and we say, oh, I see what you need. Let me coach you in how to go get it for yourself. We're going to bring you to the table and give you opportunity for impact, but if you're not the person of power, you won't have opportunity for, in, uh, in, opportunity for input. If you're not the person of power, you won't have opportunity for impact. Right? Tokenism is when you invite someone to have input without impact. And very often we invite those who have the greatest need to lead the change that we want to see. I was, um, there's an alternative to that, but I, I was once seated in, it was a baby dean, an assistant dean, and at small deans you water them, they grow up to be big deans someday. <laughs> and I was at a, a state university in hard financial times, and got called into the office with the dean, and there were several other baby deans and, and uh, some department heads. We were all gathered around. Now, you should know at that time, this was many years ago, I was chair of that state's Indian council. I had, oh, my hair down to here, was um, teaching Cherokee language on the side. And that is to say, despite my very low melanin content, anyone who knew me knew I was native at the origins. And as we're sitting in the meeting, bemoaning the fact that the state had cut the budget once again, and I'm looking at laying off 20 faculty. One of my colleagues says the following. Now, this is, not, this is as close to a quote as I can get. She did it without pausing. I actually um, will breathe in between. She, um, she noted of the budget cut, well, it's time to circle the wagons. Now, for a native person, that's an image that gets our attention. <laughs> it's time to circle the wagons because the legislature's on the war path. Now I'm actually looking up from my papers. And we're going to get scalped on this round of budget cuts. What goes on? You know why, don't you? This is both racist and sexist. Because the university is low man on the totem pole. Now, normally you could expect me to raise my hand and speak up and say, excuse me. But it occurred to me that she had spent far more time constructing that sentence than I had to deconstruct it. And so I simply gathered my papers and excused myself and walked out of the room. And immediately, my friend Bill came out after me. Oh, Bill was all agitated. And he's following me. He says, Eric, Eric, did you hear what she said? I said, yes, Bill, I did. Well, Eric, Eric, wasn't that racist? I said, yes, Bill, it was. Well, Eric, Eric, why didn't you say something? Oh, because I'm tired, Bill. Why didn't you? If it's a value, a belief, a commitment that you want to hold as your part of community, Aren't you equally responsible for speaking up to your values? Is it always going to be that when I'm the one being injured, I'm the one who has to stand for your values? Help me out, Bill. Help me out. Bill meant to help me out. And so we went out for coffee, and he started talking with me. And over the course of the next week, with his incredible generosity of spirit and open heart, I learned from Bill what I had failed to teach him all along. See, Bill shouldn't have asked me to stand up for his values at a time when I felt weakest. That was asking a lot. I wish I could have done it, but I didn't back then. But I shouldn't have asked Bill to speak to things he knew nothing about and had no experience. And so over time, I began to, to realize that there were at least four factors that we need to help each other with. And that's a part of enlightening ourselves to being full functioning members of community. 
members of a community who can stand up for our own values by standing up for others, who can speak to the needs of others without always asking them to speak to their own needs, who can, in our positions of power, affect more change than simply giving others, without power, a place to speak and be heard but not listened to. When we use our authority to speak to others, we build community and others' needs. We build community. Well, the first step toward that, truly, is simple awareness. You have to recognize our world is changing. Duluth doesn't look the same as it used to. The school system foretells a very different population in your future. Minnesota is changing more than ever before. And a school system in the Twin Cities in which 90% of those graduates 15 years ago were majority. Today, the majority are minority students. The world is changing. The first thing we need to do is simply be aware. Be aware of the changes that are happening. Our population is aging. Our population is more disabled. Our population speaks more languages than ever before. Just having awareness gives us the first direction on how to learn to build community. From there, we need to know more. Knowledge. What does it mean that our Hispanic population is on the rise? Does it mean we should learn some more words of Spanish? Well, that's fine, but probably not essential. But it does mean we should know more about it. For example, it's a population in which diabetes occurs 35% more often than in the general population. Awareness and knowledge. Well, what do you do with that knowledge? I could tell Bill about these things, but I needed to help him know what you would do, what kind of skills you need to be able to act on knowledge. Knowledge alone without skills doesn't take us very far. That's a real important distinction for us to make, having our students and those in our community gain the opportunity to practice the skills. So what does it mean, 35% more diabetes? Well, it means a lot of little things. It means training our faculty in our high schools that if a student passes out mid-lecture, it's not because you were boring. They probably have low blood sugar. It's meaning changing the mix of beverages of diet and non-diet in the pop machines. It means not inviting faculty to an all-carbohydrate uh, break room because you're not inviting anyone to a break if they can't eat it. It means putting refrigeration units to carry insulin on every floor. It means a hundred little things that together say, this is your world too, and we build to it just like we build to our own. Awareness, knowledge, and the skills to act. But you know, the first time we act, we often overact or underact. I remember the first time Bill heard someone say something about moccasins, and he went right off on them. And I pulled them back and said, Bill, they're my moccasins they're referring to. <laughs> it was OK. <laughs> but I was proud of them. Awareness, knowledge, skills, and how to get the right measure of response, practice. We have to learn to help our communities to practice building community together, being responsible to each other, taking on that mutual responsibility, and offering with generosity to be the first to help and reach out. I was at a university in New Orleans 20 years ago walking through the halls with the president, and he was explaining to me how difficult it was for them to recruit African-American students and faculty. Now, I'm thinking I'm in New Orleans. At the time, I was assistant chancellor of Nebraska. Nebraska has some difficulty recruiting African-American <laughs> students and faculty. Okay? It's an import, we used to say. That's not true of New Orleans. New Orleans, it's difficult not to meet a highly qualified person of color. But he was explaining to me that it's just, it's very hard. The students don't seem to want to come here. And so we did a simple thing. 
I said, come with me. Let's take a walk through your hallowed halls. And we walked through the hallowed halls of this esteemed institution, and we, I pointed out a, a few things that he may not have noticed. We went through the corridors and looked at the photographs of everyone who had been there before him, and they all looked like him. They didn't look like the African-American community of New Orleans. I called his office number and was put on hold, so I got to listen to the music that was playing. It was Mozart. I suggested that in New Orleans, jazz might be something that fits the community. Mozart's not from there. <laughs> Walked into the campus bookstore and looked for hair care and personal hygiene products and found not a single one for African Americans. Use different shampoo. It matters. But you can't buy your shampoo at the campus bookstore. Finally went to the barber, the hair salon that was on campus. And I asked a very simple question. I said, do you do African American hair? And the barbers quite honestly answered, no. Well, it's a specialty. If you don't know how to do it, you shouldn't. I have a friend tried to straighten his wife's hair. It grew back, but the relationship was still a little damaged. <laughs> so I said, I understand that in the heart of New Orleans, you've built an institution which says to students, if you want your hair cut, only if you're white. If you want your personal hygiene products, only if you're white. If you want to hear your music, only if you're white. If you want, I said, let's add at least one measure of something from another community. Now, was this president at all racist? Absolutely not. He had awareness that there was a community around him, but his pr knowledge, skills, and practice had never been trained for a community other than the one he grew up in and succeeded in. And it was easy for him to stay in that community, and it was difficult to be stretched beyond it. The very finest way for us to build our sense of community is to learn to stretch beyond the one we're growing up in and succeeding in. And as a sister here teaches me a few words of Swahili for the next time I greet a new student that I know I had a chance to stretch. Thank you. It's as I learn more about the Benedictine order, and President Goodwin, that I know I'm learning to stretch. Thank you. It's about an intentionality in exposing ourselves from awareness to the knowledge to serve others for their needs, not our own. The skills to speak up and the responsibility to do so when we're the one in power. I was a department chair. It was an act of self-defense back then. It was me or someone else. <laughs> and I remember listening to someone nominate someone to be chairman of this program. And I simply said, I second the nomination for chairperson. Because chairman meant exactly that. There was going to be another man chairing the program that we were discussing. The chairperson didn't. It was a subtle, simple thing. It wasn't in your phrase or confrontational, but it was the male in the room taking responsibility for the power he had in standing up for the values of others. Not always asking that now the woman should say, chairperson, please, if it matters. And if it doesn't, knowing when to pass. It's a subtle thing. It's about not having Bill complain about my moccasins when they're my moccasins, Bill. But having Bill say, excuse me, you didn't really mean circle the wagons, little man on the totem pole, did you? And having someone who has the authority, the responsibility, own the values that they want from their community. We can do that. And we can do that from each other, for each other. And when we do, as we move through those stages of awareness, knowledge, skills, and practice, we move 
from a form of tokenism where we give other people a chance to speak to our values to a form of empowerment where we speak to the values of everyone in our community. Where you don't have to worry about having a woman, a minority, a person with disability on a committee to say, excuse me, is there a place for that individual? Where you go back today and look and see, is your office wide enough for a student in a wheelchair to get around the desk and in front? Because you really don't want to have to close the door and move your furniture when they show up. And you really do want them to show up and feel you expected them all along. That's empowerment. Empowerment is when we act for others, knowingly and skillfully, and we stand for a community of values that we want to own. And so as I think about the stories to open and close with today, and the fact that I'm between you and the very next part of your day, which eventually means lunch, I think, how do I want to close? Well, with a few points. One is, you've inherited a mantle laid out a hundred years ago to shepherd an institution that gives hope to a generation beyond that that you will ever see. It is an incredible responsibility. It is being a part of a chain of faith in being able to act on that faith in your own way. It's powerful. It's a faith in a future we will not see, and that's a deep, abiding faith. It's knowing that by giving to others, they will eventually give beyond any measure we could imagine. It's about recognizing that our responsibility to community is not merely to join, but to build to build generously, mutually, responsibly. And whenever I meet a group of individuals who are already preparing to do very difficult work, whether it's creating an environment that makes students feel respected and welcome, or offering a new curriculum that's incredibly complex and difficult to master, at whatever level we touch the life of the person we encounter, it can seem I've already got enough on my plate. I read those job descriptions that were up here. They're complex. And now you want me to do one more thing? Give one more act of generosity? Think, learn, go out with new communities I haven't experienced? I'm still trying to get tenure in my own community, for those of you who are. It can be overwhelming. And when I think about that overwhelming nature of our task before us, I'm reminded of one final story about the power of not doing it all, but just doing something. I was a young professor in um, Portales, New Mexico, teaching psychology. And I wanted my students to meet and encounter the minds of great psychologists. Well, I looked in the mirror and I thought, I'm not at Harvard yet and I may never get there. I looked around at my colleagues and I thought, this semester's not theirs, but soon. So I called some people and I said, you know, if, if we get you on the telephone, if we read an article, a chapter, a book, will you just talk to my students on a conference call? Some incredibly generous people decided to help my students. I will be aged if you know any of these names. Albert Ellis, B.F. Skinner, Carl, Carl Rogers, Arnold Lazarus, Patricia Self. In psychology, these are pretty good names. And one person who agreed to talk to my class was a man named Viktor Frankl. Ah, Viktor Frankl. Well, he's important to psychology because he created logotherapy, which is a therapeutic application of existential philosophy, not something you need to worry about at this moment. <laughs> well, probably one or two of you are worried about it at this moment, but most of you don't need to. But Viktor Frankl was an original student of Sigmund Freud's. He worked and studied with Freud in the clinic every day. And he had a remarkable story. And he agreed to talk to my students. If we read his book and we'd ask some questions. So what I would want you to know about, Sig about Viktor Frankl is as a student of Freud's, he was puzzled all the time by how to bring psychoanalysis, heaven forbid, into the next century. 
You know, it was his mission in life. It was what he wanted to do. It seemed so important to him. And one day while I was working at Freud's clinic, he came home and he was jazzed. He had had a vision, he had an insight. He had seen a way to transform psychoanalysis and lay out the next generation of its development. And it meant everything to him. From then on, he'd return home from the clinic and he'd just sit at the kitchen table writing out his manuscript, pages upon pages, often neglecting his own diet, his health, his family, his friends, his children. This meant everything to him. It was his passion. It was his life. And what you should also know about Viktor Frankl is that he was Jewish. In one evening while he was working on his manuscript, the Nazis came to arrest him. He did a remarkable thing. He ran into his bathroom and he strapped nearly 300 pages of manuscript around his chest, smuggling it in under his shirt, where he hid his manuscript underneath the slats that he was sleeping on. And there, for nearly a month, he kept his vision, his passion, and his life's work alive. Until one day, the Nazis discovered his manuscript in, right in front of Viktor Frankl. They burned his life's work and his passion one page at a time. And later that week, in different camps, they burned his wife and his children. Victor Frankl was liberated, if you could call it that, literally days before his number tattooed inside of his left forearm was up. And everyone and everything he had ever cared about had been destroyed. Liberated, but not free. He was cast into a horrible despair, a despair that lasted for months going on years. And then one day, long after his liberation, Viktor Frankl had a new insight. And he abandoned psychoanalysis completely. And he wrote a book dated by its title called Man's Search for Meaning. And it was the foundation for this new therapy, logotherapy. And my students had read his book, and we had Viktor Frankl on the telephone. Now, these were the days of low tech. You had to sit in front of the speakerphone to actually talk to someone. And so I collected from my students a question or two from each of them, and I chose one question. I put them in some sort of a logical order, as if it were a conversation. The first student sat down, and she asked her question to Viktor Frankl. I was like, whoa, we're talking to Viktor Frankl. Next student asked the question, and you knew you had engaged a brilliant mind on the end of the phone. But the third student, well, the third student, he worried me a bit. He sauntered on up to that phone, and he didn't ask the question he submitted. <laughs> Instead, he said, so, Dr. Frankel, if your therapy is so good, could you have cured Adolf Hitler? Oh, my gosh. How crass, how cold. How cool. You could hear the gasp in the room as we waited for the inevitable click buzz that was about to happen. Now, Viktor Frankl didn't hang up the telephone. I can tell you, 30 seconds is a lot of silence on a telephone, especially when you're paying long distance rates to Austria and a faculty member's salary. <laughs> but then Viktor Frankl said something I will never forget. He said, Hitler. Hitler could have been a painter. Okay, I wasn't from Harvard. I thought I'd ask. Huh? And he said, Hitler spoke about it. His friends wrote about it. Everyone who knew him knew that a young Adolf Hitler, more than anything else, wanted to be a painter. He tried large murals. He knew they were ugly. Smaller canvases they wouldn't sell. But as a young man, he was content to sit on the sidewalk trying to sell pencil postcards. And no one, said Viktor Frankl, no one ever once stopped and said to a young Adolf Hitler, I see your passion for your work. I see how important it is to you. Never give up your passion, said Viktor Frankl. But for the loss of one kind word, Hitler, well, Hitler might have been a painter. And how much of the world might have been changed? I was stunned 
by that story. In our conversation with Victor, Victor Frankel continued on for another half hour, but I, I have to say I just kept replaying that one story in my mind over and over again until finally we hung up the phone with Victor Frankel and I realized why that story meant something. Far less consequential to the world, far less important. I was a young man finishing degrees in physics and psychology and thinking, well, I don't like psychology and physics is, uh, I mean, I don't like physics as much as I went on to math, you know, just frying pan into the fire. I do love math. In psychology, well, back then, that was a quick trip to the unemployment line, so. <laughs> Maybe I said I should take my father's advice and become a mechanic. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a mechanic. I can still rebuild a generator. I, they just don't still put them in cars. <laughs> and as much as it was the joy of my life with my father, it wasn't the life that I wanted. It didn't call to me, that's all. And I was about to drop out of school and find anything that didn't call to me because I was lost. And this one faculty member walked by and he said to me one sentence. Now that sentence is mine, it's not yours, I won't share it with you. It wouldn't mean anything, but to me it meant that I could live whatever dream I wanted, I could achieve whatever dream was before me. And because of that one sentence, I continued in school. I went on and got my master's, my doctorate. I've lectured in 28 countries, traveled to 32 or more. Life has been good. I don't have a lot of regrets. And I remember that moment so clearly. I ran down the hall as soon as we hung up with Victor Frankel. I called that faculty member up. And I said, Richard, Richard, this is Eric Jolly, and I want to thank you for it. And he said, who? <laughs> and that's what I understood. Every culture, every community has it. For some, it's a mitzvah, a coup, an act of grace. It's that one moment, not the grand plan. It's not the prepared script. It's that one almost casual moment when you meet someone and you reach out and you cross a barrier of age or ability or gender or race, and you give hope, hope in their future. Today he remembers me, but he doesn't remember that sentence that changed my life. Our acts of faith every day will have us generating those sentences that change lives. And if we do it with a generosity of spirit, a humbleness in approach, a sense of service, an awareness of the needs of others, and the skills to help meet their needs so they don't always have to. Well, that's when we're going to change the world. I am delighted to be here today, and my heart is full of joy because I believe if every one of us in this room, before we put our head on the pillow at night, can look back to that one moment of generosity, of shared responsibility, mutuality. And know that we just gave unrequired to one other person. Well, I believe if we do that, we can change the world. I believe that Hitler could have been a painter, and we can learn to feed each other. I thank you for the gifts you give to the futures we will not see. Have a great day.